Our second plenary speaker is Mr. Greg Delaghi of Texas Instruments, Dallas, Texas. And the title of his talk is Harnessing Technology to Advance the Next Generation Mobile User Experience. Mr. Greg Delaghi is Senior Vice President and General Manager of TIS Wireless Business Unit. He leads the IT's worldwide development of semiconductor for mobile devices, including smartphones and mobile internet devices, as well as mobile computing and mobile consumer electronics. Previously, Mr. Greg Delaghi was Vice President and Manager of TI's DSP business, where he is credited with laun launching the industry first gigahertz DSP. Greg earned a bachelor degree in business administration from Nichols College in Dudley, Massachusetts. Please join me in welcoming Greg Delaghi. Thank you, Robert. Successor. Uh -huh. Good morning, everyone. It's a, uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for, uh, for me to be here today presenting to such a large and illustrious crowd. Um, I've been at Texas Instruments for 25 years, and uh, if there's anybody who understands the magnitude of a presentation like this to a group of such, such an esteemed group, uh, it's someone who's worked at a company like TI for such an extended period of time. I don't think I could have followed a better presentation today. Um, the, some of the uh, things that were talked about from a sensor standpoint, the things were talked about what's going to happen with these applications moving forward dovetails beautifully uh, with the topics that uh, I want to spend time reviewing today. Uh, really, the essence of what I want to talk about is where mobile applications are going to go, and I want to talk about the significance of the challenges that we face as we move forward. I would tell you, and I'll, I'll end with this, but I'll also start with it, that I believe some of the fundamental challenges that we face moving forward are even greater than the challenges that we have uh, overcome as an industry in the last uh, in the last decade. So before I move too far forward, let me uh, let me start by providing a little bit of a foundation for people in terms of what wireless is. Uh, if you think about uh, the wireless business and think about what is created, wireless is one of the top industries uh, on the planet. Uh, we've seen an industry that was really driven by making uh, wireless communications or handsets inexpensive. Uh, the world was driven by uh, driving low-cost handsets into new markets. Uh, phones for people in India, phones for people in China, and they're trying to figure out a way to get everybody to get their first uh, wireless communication device. In this time, with the advancements in semiconductor lithography, everything was about driving cost and power and integration. Uh, that was really the uh, fundamental focus of the, uh, of the industry. And if you think about the dynamic, uh, we also measured success in terms of a single device that could ship hundreds of millions of units. You think about the uh, ubiquitous Nokia candy bar phone that was sold, that one model was sold in every region of the world. Uh, think about things like Motorola's Razor, those uh, very impressive designs that sold hundreds of millions of units. Um, the truth is that the industry has reached an inflection point. We have 4.7 billion people on the planet have a cell phone. At 4.7 billion out of the 6 billion people on the planet, um, you're reaching a point where you've got to do something differently. And really what's happened is that the industry over the last several years has really moved aggressively in a direction of shifting our focus to differentiation and away from just making these devices inexpensive. In essence, figuring out a way to get people to replace their existing cell phones now that, we've, uh, now that everyone on the planet has one. So if you look at uh, what we've done, really enter the smartphone. And if you think about the fundamentals of what a smartphone is, it still starts with those fundamental building blocks that were in that previous phone that I showed you. You've still got the modem, you've still got the, the RF, and you still have the power management. Those blocks have changed in complexity over time, but they are still the fundamental building blocks. And frankly, they are not where the action is when we start to talk about the next generation of this technology. The role of the application processor as we move into this world where it's about web browsing and audio and video uh, and uh, social networking and all the things that have been the craze in the wireless industry, that application processor block that I have mapped out here really becomes the center 
of the mobile device experience as we move forward. I'll also highlight uh, some of the wireless uh, connectivity technologies, things like uh, the wireless LAN and the Bluetooth and GPS. Uh, these technologies, again, increase the connectivity of that device past just a cellular network and help us get, um, uh, and help us get connected in other ways. And again, as the last speaker, Dr. Merrick, went through in some detail, the role of sensors uh, is an area that is already uh, significant and will continue to increase. This is where we are today. This is what has driven the smartphone craze, and everybody has their own favorite version of a smartphone, uh, and you can see uh, what's happened here over time. There are two additional points I want to make on the slide. The first one is if you remove those building blocks of cellular, uh, the, uh, the modem and the, and, the, and the RFs specifically, what you find is you've got the guts of a lot of different other applications as well, a portable navigation device. Uh, that's connected to multiple networks uh, with things like uh, wireless LAN and the like, uh, a portable navigation device, portable media players, as I said, e-books. That same content, that same basic building blocks are going to be much more pervasive. And so the pioneering work being done mobile, I think, will have a, a significant impact in a lot of different markets. The second point, and the reason we have the blinking animation here, is because it's really the fundamental of fundamentals when we talk about wireless. It is that power is the most important problem that we have to solve. All of these things are relatively small, and they need to fit in your pocket, and they need to last for a long time on a single battery. So with that as a backdrop, what I would tell you is, again, we have some enormous challenges in front of us that I'll walk through today, and I've broken that down into three areas. One is the performance challenge, um, and there's a lot of things that are going to happen in terms of what these devices are going to do. Uh, number two is connectivity, all the different radios, all the different ways that we have uh, to get uh, information in to the cell phone or into the mobile device and then operate it on. And lastly, uh, and again, uh, we'll spend the greatest amount of time on it, some of the challenges we have from a power standpoint. So we're going to start with the performance challenge. And to try to map this out and, and uh, express uh, some of the challenges we see, uh, we've, uh, put, we've put together a little bit of a, a video here. It's actually just a, a flash file that we put together to try to walk you through where we think the kinds of uh, things that these devices are going to do in, in time. Uh, as, I, as Albert said when he introduced me, I'm from Dallas, Texas, so I've uh, picked a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Bob. And he's going to walk us through a scenario here of, um, of how he's used his mobile phone. He's going to go to the Cowboys football game. And um, if any of you have heard anything about that big new stadium we have in Dallas, everything is bigger in Texas, obviously. It's an enormous stadium, seats 100,000 people. So the first thing Bob does is pull, use his cell phone, and it pulls up a map of the, um, of the stadium and shows him how to get to a seat. Once he's seated, he uh, decides to look at what's happening across the NFL and what's happening with some of the other, his favorite teams and what the scores look like. Could even look back at Saturday's games. Um, he's also going to do a search to see if he has any people in his social network there at the stadium with him, and he identifies the fact that there is somebody that he knows, and it's a customer of his, uh, a gentleman by the name of Randy. Um, he also uses that data that Randy's in the audience to pull up some uh, information from his contacts to understand some of the uh, mutual projects that he, have, he and Randy have working together. So you can start to see a lot of things going on there, and you're talking about some pretty significant um, uh, performance, uh, performance needs. So let's talk a little bit about that in some more detail. If you look at the last decade and think about how uh, performance has increased in that application, you know, what I would tell you is performance has increased by a factor of 300x. And the reason we say 300x is, again, I need to do a little bit of explaining here. If we were talking about something as simple as the PC, there would be one unit of measure that we could talk about in terms of the performance of the PC. We talk about MIPS. We talk about the MIPS of that machine and what the MIPS requirements were moving forward. I'm defining the, pro the performance requirements of these applications a little bit more broadly. And if you look down at the bottom, I'm, I'm defining multimedia as including imaging, graphics, video, display, and something called HDI, which is human device interaction, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. But you think about those processing tasks, it's not a single thing that's going on. So there's not a single measure that we can look at. We have to talk about Megamax. We have to talk about uh, MIPS. We have to talk about Giga Ops. We have to talk about uh, um, Giga Flops, all of those kinds of metrics. So what we've done here is map those use cases on the y-axis and given you 
a feeling for the kinds of things that need to be done and, and the, the magnitude of that processing task. So, again, you can see this as a, as a pretty significant trend. I'll give you a couple of examples to uh, explain what's happened in the last decade. Uh, first of all, if you think about uh, video a few years ago, it was more of a QCIF kind of a video experience. Uh, that video experience, um, you know, has gone very quickly to high, defi to high definition, to HD. And you're seeing, if you look at the processing task from QCIF uh, to high definition, you're looking at like a 320, 325X increase in performance. Uh, think about things like the display processing task. Uh, in the old days where you had that QCIF video, you're probably processing somewhere in the order of 230 um, thousand pixels per second as you start to go, and that was to a single display. If you start to go into a world where you're pushing that up through HD, you may have multiple displays. You know, you can quickly get into a mode where you're up in a 870, 890x kind of a range of improvement in this uh, in this kind of time frame. So you can see there's been an actual act absolute explosion. If we map this forward. Um, really, I've got two lines to show here. I think um, there's been so much advancement in the mobile field that sometimes, depending on what conversations you have with customers uh, and even internally, I think we get into a mode of some linear thinking, that, uh, that there's a curve there that things are going to slow down. And I guess what I will tell you very, very strongly is I do not believe that that is the case. I believe if you look at the advancements we've seen in the last 10 years, there is no reason other than solving some things like the power challenges, there's no fundamental reason that the demand in the marketplace, the demand that consumers give us, that mobile users give us, there's no reason in the world that that should slow down. So, you know, I think we're living in a world of a 300x kind of a uh, kind of a kind of a increase from a demand standpoint. So that is a backdrop. Let's talk a little bit about the advancements in some of the underlying technologies and the challenges that we have. I start by looking at MPU performance, and here I've got a couple of graphs, uh, a couple of things to show. First, uh, let's start by looking at uh, the x86 architecture, really the de facto standard if you talk about PCs. Uh, and the Intel, uh, uh, Intel has done just an unbelievable job with that architecture in time. But if you look at the clock rate trend over the last decade, you're really seeing it being uh, relatively flat. In fact, it's increased and starts to saturate at about 3 gigahertz. If you look at the gray line above it, you see that uh, we've actually been able to improve the effect of MIPS because we've done some things architecturally by doubling the amount of processing units, going to multi-core, as an example. And you can see that that trend line has increased. But still, even with all the tricks we have in terms of semiconductor process lithography and doing innovative things in terms of architecture where, where we're using multiple, uh, multiple engines, you're in a world where you've got a 10x increase in terms of the effect of uh, performance uh, increase. Uh, let's look at ARM, which is really the other de facto architecture, really more oriented toward portable kinds of applications. And you can see it's a pretty similar trend. The clock rate has, uh, has increased, uh, but saturates here, probably closer in the 2 gigahertz kind of a world because of the power sensitivity of the applications. And the ARM community is also doing things like symmetric multiprocessing, or SMP, to uh, add more processing capability or get the effect of MIPS up. And the line is a little bit better at 100x. But again, compare that back to the case we just made with demand in the marketplace of being 300x, and it says we've got a problem. So we've got a little bit of a performance gap. Um, I want to go back to uh, expand this analysis a little bit more to look at some of the other things that are going on with these devices and talk about the connectivity challenge. And again, the connectivity refers to the fact that it's not just a cellular connection that we have with. There's a lot of other things that are going on that is creating stress on that mobile device from an I.O. standpoint, and that's what we're going to talk about. So we're going to go back to Bob. And if you remember where we left Bob, we, we found him in the stadium. He had figured out that a customer of his was in the audience, um, and he had pulled up some mutual project information. So let's see where Bob goes from here. So the first thing uh, uh, Bob decides to do is call someone in his office to check out a little bit more background on uh, the customer program. Uh, he also decides uh, that he's going to contact Randy, the customer, uh, and sends him a quick SMS to see if they can get together while they're at the game. Um, so he goes off and he sends that SMS, um, and then it's halftime and they have a chance to meet. Uh, they get together, and you can see them using their mobile devices together. 
I uh, look at the screenshots, you can see that they're reviewing some pictures from a golf tournament that they were in, um, reminiscing a little bit about that to establish some rapport, uh, then going off and talking about some of the details of the project. And you're seeing it, if you look carefully, you're seeing it on the screen and you're also seeing a projected image that they're at, that they're looking at. Uh, they have some questions about that design and they launch a video um, conference with uh, one of the people back in Bob's office to answer a question or two. And you can see that there's just a tremendous amount of stuff that's going on inside of that conversation. And, and again, we think this is pretty accurate when you look at how complex the world has become. That scenario uh, is very, very close in terms of it being a reality. So you think about that mobile device, you think about that being the center of so many different things that we're doing, and you really have to look at the core of that whole uh, system, which is the applications processor. But let's talk about some of the details of that scenario and what is driving the connectivity challenge uh, as we move forward. We'll start with uh, what's happening on the cellular side, talk about the things that are coming into the device. You start with cellular and you think a few years ago, uh, we were just getting the initial data rates. It was, um, it, was, it was voice band and then it started to be voice plus data and we were in a world with kilobits per second of data. Uh, today, with the advent and diffusion of 3G, we're in a megabits per second kind of a world, one, two, three, five megabits, depending on exactly where you are, how far you are away from the cell tower, et cetera, et cetera. With the advancements uh, in technology and with the transition to 4G systems, uh, WiMAX and LTE, you know, we'll see 100 megabits per second to a mobile device. And remember, 100 megabits per second, the only way that that can be delivered to you as a user today is through fiber optic kinds of networks. We're talking about that same level of speed in a mobile device, very impressive. Uh, think about things that have like broadcast, uh, depending on which region of the world you come from, uh, you know, there is TV that is, uh, that is broadcast. We saw lots of uh, commercials last night on the Super Bowl for people doing uh, broadcast mechanisms with TV. We have things like FM that are broadcast, which if you're in the US may not be a very big deal to you, but if you're in other areas of the world like China or India, you're seeing some fundamental use cases that are being developed for the use of, uh, of FM technologies and broadcast to change and, and help uh, users in some of those developing, uh, developing economies. Think about things like high definition radio or digital radio broadcast. So there's a significant amount of content that'll be coming to these devices uh, from a broadcast context. Lastly, let's talk about the things that I have access to locally and locally is defined as maybe one to 10 meters is, uh, is really what we're looking at here. Think about technologies like Bluetooth, wireless LAN, and uh, things like uh, uh, body area networks. These are gonna be other networks that we have an opportunity to bring inputs into, uh, into that device. Uh, you think about Wi-Fi as maybe the most robust today. It's a, you know, 10, tens of megabits per second. Uh, 802.11G is at 54 megabits per second, but that is clearly in the next decade going to gigabits per second in terms of what I'm going to have access to locally. So that's a little bit about what I have an opportunity to bring into the device from outside. Let's almost start, let's also augment this by talking about some of the things that can happen inside of that device. Even if I turn my radio, all the radios off, think about it in, in an airplane mode kind of a thing. First of all, there's a lot going on from a, a local content standpoint. We've all seen memory in these devices expand uh, dramatically. Uh, we've seen customers building smartphones who actually differentiate their products based on how much memory they have. The four gig version, the eight gig version, the 20 gig version, that's a big part of their marketing campaign because the amount of memory that you have access to is, is uh, so important. And it's important to a mobile device user because, because of what's happened with the multimedia explosion I talked about before and the fact that these files are getting bigger and the fact that there's a tremendous amount of processing that has to happen and the transfer rates of getting these things from one processor to another is increasing uh, very, very quickly. I'll look at things like video capture, again, things that I can do with my, with my phone. We've seen uh, you know, the image capture thing go from you know, a megapixel or two to the uh, highest definition uh, capture phone that's being shipped in the marketplace today is 12 megapixels. Are you seeing things with uh, video? where high definition has come on and become uh, really the de facto standard that people are racing to deliver in, in smartphones today. You start to think about extrapolating that forward as we move from 720p to 1080p and beyond. It's not out of the realm of possibility that in the next five to 10 years, you're gonna even see cinematic quality 
images uh, being uh, operated on or captured inside of these devices. So kind of a 4K by 2K kind of resolution. And if you notice, I actually have another by two there. We have the capability to deliver stereoscopic images of that magnitude, uh, I believe, in the, in the coming decade. You start to look at that and add frame rates that double from what's common today at 30 frames per second to 60 frames per second. And a 10-minute video capture of something like that is terabytes of information. So it's an extraordinary amount of processing capability. And then lastly, uh, be able to take that information and put it across multiple displays. Uh, the simple one display kind of device that you have today is changing. You're seeing devices already with multiple displays. You're seeing devices today that also have projector options, projector options, so that I'm not limited to a small screen. And I want a small screen because it fits in my pocket, but I'm not going to be limited to that as we move forward and the computing experience or the mobile experience is going to change. So what I would, what I would uh, offer here is that that is not a simple applications processor when you start to think about what's in the middle of that system. That is a very complex, what I would say is a heterogeneous multiprocessor. That is a, a microprocessor, an applications processor, a processor built with lots of different individual engines brought together with a very high performance, low latency switch fabric to keep those individual processing units fed. It's an enormous processing task because you're talking about multiple processors being fed with terabits of, uh, of uh, terabits per second of uh, information. And again, I, you know, I, I think if we're going to deliver this experience, that is, can we deliver this experience as an industry that's really about this seamless adaptive connectivity, that scenario that we talked about uh, with Bob at the game. I want to step sideways for a minute, uh, figuratively and, and literally here, and do a quick demonstration of something called a human device interaction. Um, I've asked uh, Dor to join me on stage here. And uh, again, what we really want to show you, I, hopefully people can see with the camera, um, we've got, uh, let me just describe what you're seeing here. First is uh, you're looking at a, an OMAP uh, development system. So when a, a customer is going to do work on one of our application processors, they actually build one of these systems. Uh, what Dor is doing with his finger now is he's just doing the kinds of things that have been a revolution over the last five years. You're seeing touch kinds of interface where he touches the screen and he can move the image and you can see some of the things that are, uh, that are happening there. What's interesting now is this human device interface, I believe, is going to be one of the biggest, uh, human device interaction is going to be one of the biggest areas as we move forward. What Door is going to do now is he's going to control the image by using his hand above the device. And the way that that's working is he's using a simple front-facing camera. It's only a two-megapixel camera, very inexpensive camera. Lots of smartphones today have those. But based on the power that's in that OMAP processor, he's actually able to control, open applications, click, and go backwards um, as, he's, uh, as he's so aptly demonstrating here. This is the technology that will be in phones in the next 12 months. This is just the beginning of what's going to happen because you're going to see things like this and then you're going to start to be able to interact with projected images. And you're going to be able to do things like uh, be able to do interact from a gaming standpoint. And if you think about some of the technologies, even the things that Microsoft has talked about with their famous Natal, that I'm going to be able to have a front-facing camera to be able to go off and interact with a game, this is the class of technology that's going to be made available inside of your mobile device in the years to come. Thank you, Dor. So lots of neat things that we can go off and do, but um, the fundamental of fundamentals. All of the things that I've talked about so far will not happen unless we can figure out ways to uh, do this in a power-efficient way. It is the single biggest issue that we face as an industry. And again, as I said, some of the challenges, the challenges moving forward are even, uh, even more difficult. So let's dive into the power challenge. Um, and we're going to uh, we're gonna go back to Bob and uh, pick up where we left off. So Bob is uh, finished. He's met with Randy. He's uh, conducted his business. He's leaving the stadium now. He uses his mobile phone to find where his car is, maps his way over to his car. Um, he has uh, not been to Cowboy Stadium before, so he's uh, getting himself a map on the best way to get home. He does traffic overlays so that he can understand what the most efficient uh, way to get home with the other 100,000 people that are leaving the stadium at the same time. 
Uh, he's looked at the tasks that he had to operate for the day, um, and he's got all those things done, and, and uh, this is a pretty good feeling. You still have battery left after all the things that you've done. Um, he decides that he's going to make a phone call, and I, I, I think this vignette is, uh, is actually really striking because I think we've all been in a situation where we've had a busy day and we've had a lot of things going on, and you look at your cell phone, and the only thing you want is enough power left to make that one last call, whoever it is that you want to call. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about power. To talk about power, we have to start with with the uh, with the fundamental found, uh, foundation of what the limitation is. And we talk about um, batteries. These are small devices; they have to fit in my pocket. Uh, and so, battery technology—how much battery, how much energy I can store in ten cubic centimeters, as we uh, have listed here—becomes you know kind of fundamental. You look at the advancements in battery technology over the last 10 years, it's not really exciting. Uh, they've got a couple of papers down here that, have, uh, that, I'm, uh, that I'm mentioning, and there are some things that are happening from uh, a battery chemistry standpoint, and a lot of development going on there, and they show some promises of getting the slope of that line to change. And that's very, very promising. The problem is that if you look at what that demand is, the need for power is with everything that we've outlined here, You've got a, we've got a gap that is increasing. Look at, the, look at the graph a little bit more closely. Look at what happened in, in 2003, 2004, 2005. It started to increase, and then in 2006 and 2007, it started to increase faster. The things that drove it in 2006 and 2007 were the initial data rate capability, that some kind of multimedia functions were starting to happen, and then number two, color displays. So that started to change it, but then look at the exponential curve that we've been on over the last several years. And again, this is, I think, the single biggest issue that we face as an industry when we start to deal with appliances that are doing, that become fundamental to our daily life and operation. And I'm doing web cases and email cases and video cases and 3D graphics and social networking, and they're always on and always connected, and I can't be without it. It's got to last multiple days, and this is a, a huge issue. So let's talk about some of the things that we as an industry have, uh, have done to try to deal with this. Uh, first of all, uh, let's look at uh, general purpose processors. Obviously, back in that uh, heterogeneous multiprocessor architecture that we talked about, uh, there are general purpose processing elements in there. And the general purpose community has done a good job of reducing uh, power, power being uh, or, en or energy efficiency being measured as milliwatts per MIPS. You can see what this trend line has looked over time. In fact, if you look at it over uh, the last decade, it's at, it's at about a 10x decrease. And this is a combination of things we've done architecturally inside of the general purpose domain, as well as things we've done with the process uh, with process um, migration. Uh, we've taken some different approaches architecturally. Uh, what we've done in terms of DSP or programmable uh, digital signal processors, again, not as general purpose as the general purpose processors, but for specific functions, they've brought uh, a, a different slope and a different line and a different energy efficiency than anything we could do from a general purpose standpoint. And anybody who's been close to designing any of these deeply embedded systems also knows that, you know, the hard wiring something is always going to give you the best result if all you care about is, is uh, for performance and power. You don't get as much flexibility, but you do get the best result in terms of performance and power. So what, you know, with that as a backdrop, what I tell you is that we've spent a lot of time, I have spent a lot of my career arguing back and forth about the, the different merits and benefits to each of these approaches, arguing that one is better than the other. And what we found out today in this heterogeneous multiprocessor kind of a world, the answer is not a single thing. The answer is how do I combine these dissimilar elements in the right proportion to maximize power and performance? So this is obviously a very big area that we've been spending a lot of time on. Uh, let's talk about our old friend, uh, silicon and uh, silicon process lithography advancements and sil silicon process technology. Uh, that's been something that's driven the industry, as I've talked about before. But if you look at this chart and think about the role and impact that leakage has had, on this industry, and the leakage is defined as SRAM IDBQ in this graph, you can see that things were pretty well behaved uh, through 130 nanometer. And at 90 nanometer, the component of leakage increased by 40%. And that was annoying, but not devastating. Where it got to be devastating is when you look at what happened at 65 nanometer, 
and that's an order of magnitude increase in leakage. And you see that something fundamentally different has to be done there or we'll actually go backwards in power as we try to solve some of these problems. So uh, we've, done, uh, we've done a lot of work on this. There are some, if you go and, and look at the papers that, are, um, uh, that have been published even as recently as, uh, as this year, you'll see some uh, papers on um, uh, some power management techniques that we call smart reflex. And basically what we've been able to do with some pretty aggressive approaches there is we've been able to keep that leakage issue from becoming a really meaningful impact uh, at the system level. But it's required us to work very differently than how we have in the past. Not work as much at the transistor level, but start to work up a little bit higher and do some aggressive things in terms of uh, circuit level uh, circuit level design and, and power management techniques. Let's take a look at a couple of those things as an example. Um, I've got two to show you today. One is, uh, this is actually a, a, an OMAP3 application processor from Texas Instruments. It's at the heart of many of the, of the smartphones that are uh, out in the marketplace today. It's a 65 nanometer design. Um, and you can see that there are several techniques that are listed here. The SRAM retention, uh, logic power gating channel length, um, uh, logic retention, um, the adaptive voltage scaling, and, and, um, and DVSS. So you can see that there's uh, significant advancements that have been made. And if you look at what that means at the chip level, at the system level, Again, not at an individual block, but look at that bigger level. You can see that we were able to drive a, a 300x uh, improvement in terms of uh, in terms of leakage power. Uh, we didn't stop there. As I said, the power became even uh, as, as is still an issue and an increasing issue uh, at 45 nanometer. And what you can see here is we built on that foundation of what we established at 65. Another paper that was presented in uh, 2008. Um, taking those techniques done in 65 and building on those with adaptive body biasing and also retention till access some techniques for those large blocks of memory on chip so that uh, the leakage didn't, uh, uh, didn't uh, materially impact us at the SOC level. And you can see in this case, again, at an SOC level, 45 nanometer implementation, able to drive a 1,000x uh, increase in, uh, or decrease in terms of uh, active power. So um, some pretty impressive things that have been done. But we can't stop there, uh, and there are a lot of things that are being done in the industry today to uh, to try to work on uh, on on power. Um, and I want to spend just a few minutes talking about some of the things that we get pretty excited about, and hopefully will be points of stimulation for the audience. Uh, first is we've talked a little bit about video today, and and the role that video has played in terms of where the applications are going. Um, if you look at uh, at uh, a standard. Uh, a standard video uh, uh, decoder, look at something like H.264. This is an example of, uh, in 2009, some work was done to, to implement a low power design of, uh, of this codec. This is 720p, so it's a high definition video codec. It operates at 30 frames per second, and it was implemented in 65 nanometer CMOS. But if you look at that, it's got less than two milliwatts of uh, power consumption at a VDD of uh, 0.7. So this, again, the approach that was taken here was to take a very, it was a much more of a parallel processing kind of task. The area actually grew uh, by 12%. It operates at 14 megahertz, but still this is an order of magnitude better power than anything else uh, in, the, uh, in the industry. Uh, let's talk about this world where I'm powering things with a battery and I need to figure out how to power a very low power chip directly from the battery and, and reduce some of that additional circuitry. Some very exciting things that are being done in terms of uh, DC to DC converters and implementing DC to DC converters on chip and bulk CMOS. Uh, you look at uh, the kinds of things we've done with switch capacitors, uh, DC to DC converters with no external inductors and we've been able to drive a very impressive 75 percent efficiency at 10, 10 microamps. So you can see uh, some pretty interesting things that are being done here with, uh, with um, DC to DC converters. The next example I want to spend a minute touching on is let's look at uh, ultra low power medical processor. And the reason I show this one is because it's the last two that I've shown have been a little bit more component level technologies. This really starts to show how the industry is taking the component level technologies and now starting to implement them a little bit more at the chip level to solve a specific application problem. So this is an ultra low power medical processor. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an MSP430 16-bit microcontroller uh, that operates down to 0.3 volts VDD. 
Um, it does have uh, leverages an AT SRAM cell. It does utilize a, a not exactly the same, but a similar design with the DC to DC converters. And again, uh, really breathtaking in terms of uh, how low power this implementation is. And think about new markets that this technology can start to open up for us. Think about things like ambulatory medicine where somebody goes to a crash scene and they can take uh, actual devices, attach them onto the, the, the person who was injured at the site with no wires. Uh, those things can tran be transmitted through a body area network to another device to be transmitted so that the best care can be, uh, can be given to the person uh, in the field. Very exciting, but completely new dimensions in terms of what needs to happen from, uh, from a low power standpoint. And lastly, probably the, the holy grail is how do we get energy out of nowhere? How do we get energy from the environment around us? There is a lot of pioneering work that's going on today. We've got a graph here showing uh, some of the ranges from uh, microwatts to milliwatts in terms of the differences between some of these approaches. Um, there's a lot of research here, and you know, it's, uh, I think this is one of the most exciting areas and something that we'll be talking about at conferences like this for years to come. I'd also tell you that I think that there is significant need for advancement in um, some of the interface electronics that's going to need to go around uh, this class of technology. So the last area to talk about in terms of the ways we can deal with these aggressive problems and in, in terms of uh, what we're facing as an industry is we, you know, we probably need to spend a minute talking about packaging. If you look at some of the things that we've done with packaging, specifically in, a mobile, in the mobile uh, device world, uh, you see things like uh, stack dies. Um, where we've actually combined the similar uh, chips in a single package. You may know this as more of a, a system and package or SIP kind of an approach. It does include three-dimensional uh, 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 bonding wires. Uh, you see things like uh, stacked packages or, or pop packages where we actually take two dissimilar devices and combine them together. This is the class of what's in the phones that you have in your pocket today. We've pioneered these approaches. We've brought them into high-volume production, and we've commercialized them um, to because of the unique things that they're able to do uh, to solve some of the problems. Remember that the shorter the wires, the higher the performance, the better thermal char characteristics we can drive, and through doing things in the three-dimensional context, we can also make things smaller, which keep your mobile devices small as they get an additional capability. As we move forward, there's a whole new wave of things that can be done in this 3DIC context. Uh, we look at things like through silicon vias uh, and inductive and optical coupling uh, as the next great uh, plateau, great great uh, uh, place for um, um, uh, invention to come, really getting to the point where you look at uh, the ability to try to combine some dissimilar technologies and produce technologies in the most uh, efficient way you can in their most efficient processes, but now combine these things into a single package, a single solution that optimizes performance and bandwidth and, and also thermal characteristics. So some really pioneering things that are, uh, that are being done here. So a couple of things, uh, a couple of things to, uh, to leave you with today. I think uh, number one, hopefully through the course of my talk, and we talk about where the industry is going, hopefully you can see some of the ways that we've leveraged silicon technology and we've leveraged things like circuit technology to build uh, some of the advancements that we've delivered on the ways we've been solving these problems in a mobile context uh, over the last few years. Uh, I hopefully uh, have given justice to some of the things that we've started to do with architecture and packaging. Those have been the fundamentals that have enabled the, the, um, the, the, the progress that we've made. I think the area that we haven't spent nearly enough time on today is the area of what happens at a software and a system level. Uh, and what I would offer to the group here today is that I would tell you that I think that's really where the action is going to be. And we haven't spent as much time on it because this is a circuits convention. But I think that if we, we all are going to have to stretch ourselves to be able to think differently about we probably need a much greater amount of effort at the top here to be able to leverage all the technologies that we have as we move forward. These devices that we're talking about in a mobile complex are going to be uh, much more complex. They're going to run high-level operating systems, and they are going to have the ability to control things down to the transistor level. It's up to us in terms of our ability to be able to leverage that technology and to optimize these devices for, uh, for, um, for power and performance. 
So in closing, you know, I would I would uh, I would say that uh, most of what we've been able to do in wireless in the in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, it's been enabled by silicon scaling and the technology that we've been able to drive there. But I'd also say that even Gordon Moore admits that no exponential curve lasts forever. And I tell you that the advancements in silicon um, technology and the ways that we can leverage that to solve the magnitude of processing tasks that we have in mobile devices and mobile applications are not going to be enough. If you look at the kinds of things that we've done in our OMAP 4 processor, I've spent a lot of time talking about some of those things today. We've talked about smart reflex technologies. We've talked about heterogeneous architectures. We've talked about all of the things we've done. I believe that we've got the bases covered with that class of technology for about the next three years, the next wave of mobile applications that you're going to be seeing and playing with. The gap that we've got as you think about the magnitude of what has to happen in the next decade, we've got significant gaps as an industry. Mobile users will continue to demand more. So I think our challenge as an industry is to find and deliver another 100x in energy efficiency so that we can stay ahead of that energy gap. I appreciate uh, everybody's time and attention. Thank you very much, Greg, for that outstanding.